Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ryan and today we are back with a two-part series on patch antenna basics. Today in part one, we're going to discuss how to derive the design for a patch antenna, the types of patch antennas, types of feed methods, problems with feed methods, um, and such like that. And then in the next video for part two, we're going to discuss how to simulate and model a patch antenna in CST microwave suite, and then how to optimize the design for specific resonant frequencies, bandwidths, and etc. cetera. Uh, it should also be noted that you should have a basic understanding of transmission line theory in order to grasp patch antennas, but other than that, it's a pretty primitive concept. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Okay, so let's talk about some of the geometries. So. Patch antennas come in many types of flavors in terms of geometry. You can have rectangular slash square. Um, you can have circular or ovular. You can have a monopole or dipole. And the list kind of goes on. Uh, you can really kind of do any geometry. It's just going to affect how it resonates, uh, its polarization, um, and a bunch of other factors like that. And speaking of polarization, there's main, mainly three types. You can have linear, you can have right-hand circular polarization or left-hand circular polarization. And the way you achieve that polarization um, it depends on multiple factors. It can be uh, how the geometry of the patch antenna is set up, such as tapers on a square patch on opposite corners, or it can be achieved by a feed method, um, such as when you're trying to achieve aperture coupling, you can apply circular polarization like that. You can have it on parasitic elements, and the list kind of just goes on. On the right-hand side of the board, you can see a basic microstrip patch. This is a simple two layer. You can see the ground on the bottom, the substrate in between and the patch on top. And this model's typical microstrip behavior. Okay, so before we actually design our patch antenna, we need to clear some prerequisites out of the way. Firstly, we're gonna go with a typical square patch antenna with linear polarization. Uh, this is probably the most primitive and easy to design. So that's what we'll start off with for today. Our substrate is going to be a Rogers 4350C, which has a dielectric constant of 3.48, and we're going to give it a height of 0.8 millimeters. And we're going to design our patch antenna today to resonate at around 6 gigahertz. Now, a couple things I want to clear out of the way. First being that there is no set in stone way to design a patch antenna. Today we're going to be using the equations derived from antenna theory by Bolanus. Um, however, there's other routes you can take and none provide a perfect patch. Uh, that's why it's important to model and simulate it in CST and use things like the parameter study option to optimize your patch antenna. But using these equations, we'll get a really solid footing to get a head start. Another thing is that using substrates like FR4 for higher frequencies is probably not the best idea because it's extremely lossy. Um, my general rule of thumb is if the resonant frequency is at or above 6 gigahertz, it's probably within your best interest to go with a PTFE based substrate like Rogers or other manufacturers. But if you really don't care about loss and you're kind of just want to radiate something, then FR4 might be okay. And it's definitely okay for anything sub gigahertz because anything sub gigahertz is basically just DC. Okay, so here we have the first two equations. The first thing that we start off with is the width of the patch antenna. As you can see, it's pretty much a function of wavelength with respect to the dielectric constant of the substrate. And this gets us for six gigahertz around 16.74 millimeter. The next step is to calculate your effective dielectric constant. This is different from the substrate dielectric constant because it takes into account its height and the patch width. So here you get dielectric constant plus one over two uh, plus dielectric constant minus one over two times one plus 12 substrate height over width raised to the degree of 12. And for this we get 3.796. Now I will forewarn you this equation right here, depending on how you calculate it, will give you in meters. And if your height is in millimeters, such as ours, 0.8 millimeters, you'll have to convert this to millimeters so that these are the same unit. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and move on to calculating our length, ground plane, and stuff like that. Okay, so here we see the equation for length. 
which again, strongly correlated to wavelength, um, which is L equals the speed of light over two times the resonant frequency times the square root of the effective electric constant. And for ours, again, we got 12.831 millimeters. Now, we need to calculate for this thing called the fringing effect. Basically, it's the curling of the electric flux lines near the edge of the patch, which cause it to be extended. And it kind of looks somewhat like this, but my diagramming is, of course, terrible. So in that case, we call this delta L. Um, and up next, I'll give you the equation for combining these two. Uh, but it's effectively the effective dielectric constant plus 0.3 times width over height plus 0.264 divided by, again, the effective dielectric constant minus 0.258 times width over height plus 0.8 times 4.12 times the substrate height. It's a mouthful. All of it should be in the same unit, either millimeters, centimeters, meters. It should all be uniform if you want a uniform answer. And for this, we got 0.372 millimeters. Okay, so now we have the actual length calculated by the original length minus two times the delta length or the fringe length. And for that, we're getting 12.087 millimeters. And yeah, now we have our final, final dimensions with length. And it's gonna come like this. Now I say final in air quotes because um, you'll see that it's not gonna exactly resonate at our target resonant frequency first try. Uh, this is difficult because these equations don't take into account uh, a lot of things. I mean, don't get me wrong, they take into account a lot of things, such as the fringing effect, the effective electric constant, um, the fact that the width and the length differ, stuff like that. But you'll see that other things like ground length, uh, feed position, feed impedance input, um, and the impedance input that's at the center versus the outside, it starts to complicate things even more. Uh, and this is what CST is gonna help us with in the future video. So now that we have our actual dimensions, we're gonna go ahead and calculate our ground dimensions. And this is done pretty easily. All right, so as you can see on the board, the ground width is equal to six times the substrate height plus the width, which is in our case, 21.504 millimeters. And the ground length is six times the substrate height plus the length which again, in our case, is 16.887. Um, and the ground length ends up also being the substrate length as well. So the substrate and the ground plane should both be the same size, and then the patch, which sits atop the substrate, should be its normal patch dimensions. Now, you might be wondering, Ryan, why can't the patch and the ground dimensions be the same? Well, I'm glad you asked. And that's because microstrip patches assume that it has an infinite ground return path. Um, and if you've ever like, you know, seen an antenna, they don't have an infinitely big ground plane. So we have derived six times the substrate height divided by two on either side to be plenty for it to maintain its performance, but also have uh, a good return path. Okay, so on the board, I have probably the three most basic ways to feed a patch antenna. The first, which is the one that we'll be modeling and simulating in part two, is called the probe feed. And this is essentially um, a via, but not a via, placed somewhere in the patch, not near the edge, but also not in the middle. And the signal goes from the back through the probe and into the patch. And it's there that the patch radiates. The second is the inset feed, probably the easiest for antenna on package, like antenna on like the PCB, like for radars and stuff. Um, because a microstrip line simply goes into the patch. Now you might be wondering what are the insets for, the little, you know, chops away from the antenna that are right next to the feed line. And that's simply for, you guessed it, impedance matching. Uh, we can talk about this in another video. Um, it's generally that it insets around one third of the width, but that's another thing you can optimize in CST. Um, and the third and final, but not really final one, is aperture coupling. And this one you don't really see as often for a couple of reasons, but it's actually starting to gain popularity. Uh, with 5G. So there's a bunch of ways that you can parasitically feed patches, um, such as where you have a microstrip line approach the patch antenna, but not actually touch it. It actually gets parasitically fed, kind of similar to the inset feed, but kind of different. You can have an inset feed where you have a quarter wave transformer before it instead of insets, except it's not really inset at all, actually. 
And then you can have, of course, like stacked parasitics and all types of stuff, which you kind of use to like increase bandwidth and all types of crazy stuff. But we'll be covering that in later videos and specifically aperture coupling as well, because I believe that needs some recognition because I really like this method. I wanted to discuss one of the most common problems with probe feeding. And you'll see this in the next video in part two, when we try to simulate our patch antenna with a probe feed, is that a probe feed assumes that it's a perfect copper pillar that um, pretty much penetrates the substrate and then is connected at the patch. Um, now the problem is that this is extremely hard to manufacture. Well, you might be like, why? All it basically is, is a via, and you're not wrong. It is indeed a via, most of the case, or most of the time, sorry. And um, the problem with the via is that it's not a perfect pillar. Um, even if you drill the diameter all the way down to the minimum that you can manufacture, it's not a pillar that goes through. They just plate the inside of the drill. So it's not at all a pillar. It ends up looking somewhat like the one, the terrible diagram that I drew on the right, where it's a plated drill, not actually a pillar. And they're very different. They have very different properties. And they're, it's just kind of frustrating because that's gonna affect your input impedance and your visoir and a bunch of other factors that you really don't wanna mess with. So in CST, we'll be assuming that we're gonna use a pillar, but we can also model using a via because it's more realistic in the terms of manufacturability. All right, so that was a lot to digest about patch antennas, but hopefully it gave you the basic idea on how they work, how to design them, and what kind of goes into the design of a patch antenna. Uh, in the next video, we're gonna be calculating the probe feed position, how to model one in CST, how to simulate it in CST, and how to optimize it in CST. All of which are very important if you wanna actually manufacture a working patch antenna.